morning, everyone. And um, yeah, sorry I couldn't make it in person today, um, but I'm happy to be here to provide a little presentation about our farm and some of our civil pasture work. And also, you know, before I get to our farm, I'll provide some some sort of a tour of silvo pasture um, around the planet, really, and just sort of in introduce that concept and practice. Um, my name is Tyler Carlson. I've been uh, farming in Sox Center for about 10 years now, primarily raising grass-fed beef and lamb for direct sale um, to families and retail markets and so some wholesale markets um, in the state of Minnesota. Um, our farm is in uh, Sox Center, uh, by in Todd County, but near Sox Center, uh, we got 200 acres of of land at the home farm, and about another 45 acres of native grass that we're renting, with another 70 or 80 acres coming on uh, this spring. We also have been raising some shrub fruit, uh, honeyberries, and sour cherries, mostly just kind of trial experimentation scale. We've got about 80 uh, sour cherry shrubs and about 150 honeyberries. We've been growing them for seven or eight years now. And we're always experimenting with other perennials, some log-grown shiitake mushrooms to make use of some of the, some of the uh, wood thinnings from our forest systems and starting to add asparagus. And we have interest in hazelnuts and perennial wheat. Um, and for the last two years, just over two years, I've been, I've been working as a consultant for the uh, Sustainable Farming Association of Minnesota as their civil pasture and agroforestry project lead. Um, so I believe Gary just gave you a bit more of an introduction and overview of what civil pasture is, but um, the technical definition is the intentional integration of trees, forage, and livestock into one intensively managed agricultural production system. And basically we can get there two ways. We can either take a field or an open pasture and add, you know, pasture and or trees to that system and then introduce a, a, a managed rotational grazing system and the infrastructure required to do so. Um, or we can take an existing wooded system or plantation and usually through some thinning, oftentimes the introduction of some forage, some desirable forages, depending on the goals, and then, uh, you know, introducing livestock with a rotational grazing system into that um, as part of a holistic, you know, uh, managing all three components together towards uh, mutual benefit. Silval pasture is not um, just sort of what we have come to come to term just sort of the exposure of woods to livestock. Um, this obviously is not really, you know, especially these photos here are examples of a system that are not really doing much good for anyone. This is not good for the trees. This is not good for the soil or water or the climate. And it's not good for the livestock, really. There's not much food there. There's probably, you know, an excessive amount of, you know, maybe poisonous plants or just generally not a great uh, forage base for livestock to thrive on. Provide some shade, that's about it, I guess. Um, the potential benefits of silvopasture are substantial and fairly diverse. So the, the, de the devil's in the details um, with silvopasture. There's obviously a lot of um, interest in, you know, sort of the, the shade benefits and the microclimate benefits and what that can do for providing a more optimal or beneficial environment for forage and livestock to be reared in. And um, so we see, you know, in, we see, you know, reduced stress, you know, and particularly high heat times a year, increased growth, better, um, better digestibility, better forage quality, and just generally more comfortable animals, um, which, you know, adds, adds at certain times of year, at least pretty substantial benefits to a, a landowner's bottom line. Um, there's also a lot of interest in the soil health, water quality, carbon sequestration potential of silvo pasture systems, wildlife and pollinator habitat, some of the aesthetics associated with the systems, and, and increasingly even like um, habitat restoration work around like invasive species control and maybe like um, oak savanna restoration. Um, the, the, these systems, silvo pasture has the potential to, um, you know, to provide many of these benefits, but the, the design of the system, the components of the system, how we manage the system, how we graze the system, you know, how we're, how we're managing those livestock, when they're grazing, where they're grazing and why are key components to achieving, um, the outcomes that we desire. 
Um, from a producer standpoint, you know, the benefits look like risk management, particularly during hot and dry conditions, and, uh, improved average daily gains, potentially greater overall carrying capacity if they're, um, you know, bringing in a wooded system or, a, a, you know, maybe a plantation um, and adding forage. So they're in total increasing their forage resources. Um, there's, you know, habitat and aesthetics. Um, <clears throat> Uh, sort of driven reasons that producers might get into this. They might be interested in savanna restoration or interested in maybe hunting or birding activity on their farm. Um, and, and whether for income or just for their own personal use. Um, and then there's, you know, sort of growing interest in carbon markets, other alternative markets, and, and potentially timber harvest in some areas. Um, this graph just shows the general you know, it shows the general traditional pasture forage growth curve, which I would say in this photo is a little bit excessive for Minnesota. But, you know, in the southeast, you've got a lot of growth in the, you know, April to July time frame, and then things kind of shut off. And, you know, we don't have quite the extreme, you know, summer heat that they have there, but we still see this curve. And this just shows that with silvopasture, pasture, we're often seeing an, an earlier onset to growth in the spring and ex a slight extension in the fall. And um, I would say pretty substantially actually reduced sort of drop in forage production in that high peak summertime. And that's where really silvo pasture shines is in that, you know, July, August timeframe when the, when the open pastures are kind of shutting down or becoming lignified and losing their quality just due to the heat. Um, just real quickly, wanted to provide some, um, some data, some numbers behind silvo pasture that have been found in from various case studies. Um, these are pretty much all mostly um, here in North America, except for maybe the first one here. Um, so for example, here, there was one study that looked at ewes under acacia silvo pasture. They found that the ewes gained twice the average daily gain and utilized half of, they, they consumed half of the water that ewes grazing in open pasture, um, you, you know, yeah, compared to open pasture use. And then in another study, there was a 20% increase in average daily gain for cattle um, grazing in silvo pasture versus open pasture. And in a study that looked at dairy cows, they found 10 to 19% increase in milk production and a 19.1% increase in conception rates. So pretty substantial numbers there. Um, looking at the trees here in a conifer plantation, they found a 12 to 44% increase in tree height and a nine to 56% increase in tree diameter. And um, when looking at the silvo pasture system compared to um, just a timber plantation, they found that the silvo pasture system, when looking at the livestock and tree growth value, they found a 70% greater net present value over that plantation system alone. Um, another study found that silvo pasture uh, realized a 40 to 60% higher pasture rental rate for the landowner. And um, another study there at the bottom showed a 13.4% overall rate of return um, for a silvo pasture system compared to um, a 6.1% return for just the coastal pasture and an 8.8% uh, for the timber plantation alone. And that's from, I believe, Georgia. And oftentimes um, there have been a number of studies over the years that have shown sort of a, a general range of that 12 to 14 percent is fairly consistent as, a, as an overall rate of return for silvo pasture. <clears throat> um, silvo pasture is really a global and um, basically ancient agroforestry practice. Um, on the left here is the Deheza system in Spain. This is probably more than 2,000 years old. This is a very, very old um, complex agroecological farming system. And um, so these oak trees here are providing cork um, for the like wine and just general whatever other uses cork is used for um, as an industry. It's a sustainably harvest product from those trees. They also provide acorns that drop and are then grazed by hogs. And then sheep and cattle are grazed on the forage um, at appropriate times of the year. And you can see that those forage systems there have, you know, there's a fair amount of diversity in that that um, that sort of pasture system. I see a lot of flowers and a lot of herbaceous grasses and things too. Um, arguably, increasingly, I'm I'm finding from the work that I've been doing the last two years that really the oak savanna and 
and the oak woodlands and, and really many of the forest types of the eastern North America, really many of the forest types of North America prior to colonization might be considered something of a silvopasture. Um, particularly the oak savanna, you know, here at home, we've been studying this a lot and it's pretty hard to, you know, kind of understand the history and the ecological history of the savanna without understanding the use of um, indigenous fire and the knock on and intertwined effects of grazing herbivores that went with that. So kind of different tools compared to the, you know, the modern use of livestock and, and, and some of our other equipment and things. But, um, you know, there's a very intentional use of fire to, you know, uh, sort of manage that landscape, which resulted in something that looks pretty much exactly like a silvo pasture that one might try to go out and create today. Some examples here, just real quick touring around the world. Um, the upper left corner, I'll just go clockwise. Um, here's Brazil with this, uh, this uh, hardwood silvo pasture with cattle um, down in Brazil. In this top center, there is uh, poplar trees with sheep in the UK. Um, got chicken in a, uh, looks like an apple orchard in the Netherlands there. Um, palm oil with cattle silvo pasture in Malaysia. Um, in this bottom center, there is a poplar wheat chicken silvo pasture in China, which is pretty interesting. It's actually, I guess I would argue that's probably more of a, a wheat poplar alley cropping system that's transitioning to silvo pasture or I mean it's already kind of silvo pasture it's kind of an integration of both alley cropping and silvo pasture at the same time which is pretty interesting um, and on the lower right there is baby doll sheep in a vineyard in New Zealand so again this is global um, you know just about every continent that has agriculture has I mean every continent that has agriculture has some form of silvo pasture these are modern examples silvo pasture has probably been around for many centuries or millennia um, throughout the world here in North America, um, again, going clockwise, starting in the upper left, goats and southern pine or yellow pine. Um, this is from Tuskegee, Alabama. I think that's from their research station down there or one of them. Um, top center, this is cattle in a black locust. I believe this is a planted black locust plantation in Vermont. Um, and upper right there are hogs in an apple orchard. This is from Hoke Orchards in La Crescent um, here in Minnesota. And bottom left, or I should say, I guess I'm going clockwise. Uh, bottom right there is um, Tom Barthel's farm. He's one of our uh, sort of core, you know, early adopter silvopasturists here in Minnesota, who's been um, using bison and I think cattle at times um, to, to really try to restore his savanna. You know, he's been trying to save his big open grown oaks that are, uh, have been kind of overgrown by red oak and other native trees and some, you know, probably some invasive shrubs and things here and there and just trying to save those trees. So he's been working with chainsaw and everything else and also livestock to try to shift that system back into a more healthy savanna like um, ecosystem there. Uh, lower center is the Main Street project, um, at least I think used to be based out of Northfield, uh, but yeah, you know, they're kind of based in Southern Minnesota there. They've got their sort of fame now, fam now famous to me, at least uh, chickens and hazelnut uh, project. Um, and then the bottom left is in Mexico. This is a sheep and agave system underneath mesquite trees. And the mesquite is, or I should say the agave is harvested, um, you know, as a crop for, um, I think tequila, and then uh, the byproduct is actually used as a cheap forage or cheap feed stuff um, for livestock. So there's kind of uh, multiple crops being reared there and multiple ways in which those crops are interacting in that system. Pretty interesting. Um, so again, just like bringing it back to Minnesota here, where and why are, might silvo pasture be of use or value in Minnesota? Um, the oak savannas and oak woodlands, you know, historically would have been very fire um, sort of uh, dominated or dependent uh, landscapes. And they would have had a lot of large mammal impact following along those fires and attracted to the diversity of conditions, attracted to the shade, attracted to the diversity of plants. You know, certainly at different times of year would have found um, great forage resources there. Um, equally here, obviously, the tall grass aspen parklands, you know, where you, anywhere you've got kind of an understory that would have been an herbaceous dominated understory would have had historically substantial um, 
uh, you know, large mammal um, impacts um, or activity and interactions, as well as probably fire. And those, you know, the, so the grazing herbivores and the fire are interacting in various ways to maintain the, those complex ecosystems. And since we've lost most of the large herbivores outside of deer, I guess, um, you know, ways in which we can reintroduce some of those, some of those grazing impacts, you know, if we do it the right way and, um, you know, we monitor what we're doing and we adapt our, our practices, um, I think that there's opportunities for silvopasture to be beneficial, you know, ways of managing these systems. Um, I just have here this open pine forest. In the work that I've been doing the last couple of years, um, just for my own research, I've come across some new things to me, um, just sort of as a, a just, you know, ecologist. I, I, I have come across some information that suggests that most of Eastern North America prior to colonization was actually much more of this open grown canopy with a very diverse herbaceous understory, um, largely pine and oak, um, not just the oak savanna, not just the oak woodlands out here on the Western edge of the Eastern Broadleaf Forest, but you know, in, in some assessments, more than 50% of the Eastern Broadleaf Forest um, all the way to the coast um, and down to the Gulf would have been these open old growth, you know, old growth pine, old growth oak, um, various densities, various fire regimes, but largely managed by indigenous fire, you know, some probably just natural fire or whatever. Um, and, and of course, then the, the knock-on effects and inter, the intertwined um, sort of effects of the grazing animals that would have gone with that. Here in Minnesota, again, I see the, you know, general, I guess I should go back. So I guess a question I have is if the open pine forest and the open canopy forests of Eastern North America were something that were, was generated by people using fire and, you know, there's a lot of complexity in those systems, is it possible for something like this to be regenerated even here in Minnesota? if a land manager decided they wanted something like this. It would be a novel forest type from, you know, a forest manager's perspective today, but I don't see a reason why this couldn't technically um, be recreated or something novel be created with this type of management. Um, here we have these pine plantations now, poplar plantations. Um, you know, there, there's not a lot of diversity here. And uh, if, we, if we thin these out, you know, we can, we can um, transition these systems to silvopasture, which maybe would be a better, you know, net present value, net economic return to a, to an operator, um, to a land manager. And, and maybe, maybe we can get some even better, you know, ecological benefits out of the system by having some more diversity and having the animal, you know, sort of the benefits of having livestock out on the land. Um, you know, if we get good management, I think that there's some opportunities here. Um, there's, as I showed earlier, the Hoke Orchards and um, the Main Street projects, um, you know, chicken and hazelnut thing. I'm, I'm seeing the, the interest in utilizing livestock integrated with fruit and nuts growing very quickly. Um, there's a lot of complications with that because of the, the high value fruit and nut crop and the uh, food safety concerns, but there's a lot of really innovative ways to to bring livestock in for, you know, some real good vegetation management benefits, as well as just like orchard hygiene, you know, cleaning up the drops and mitigating some of the, uh, the vectors and, and overwintering sort of resources for pests within those orchards. Um, so there's a lot of interest there. And I see a lot of opportunity for that if we can be creative. Um, similarly with the Christmas tree plantation, this is something that's actually not that new. Um, I've seen this um, uh, in, in various sort of uh, case studies across the country. It's not exactly common, but it's something that's been done and sheep seems to seem to do well with Christmas trees. And of course we have Christmas tree plantations here. So this is an opportunity for some of those producers or someone wanting to get into that um, to think about that. So now to our farm and our practices and what we've been doing for the last 10 years, we've got really both, both systems, both ways of generating silvopasture we've been, we've been working with at Early Boots Farm. And um, so in 2012, we planted pines, both white and red pine into, uh, you know, what were old hay fields, in some cases, 
in, 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 in one area, there was, it was old cornfield. So right here on the left, this was a cornfield the year before. And so we've planted um, pasture and planted trees into this system. Um, I'll get into that more a bit here in a minute. And then on the right, then we also worked with um, sort of existing oak dominated or historically oak dominated forest systems and started to started to work with silvopasture the other way, which is sort of generally modifying the, the canopy of the forest and introducing forage and introducing livestock um, and, and, and adaptive managed grazing and just sort of observing what we see. So I'm just gonna go through a quick tour of that. Um, so planting trees out into fields on the left here, you can see it kind of gives you a sense of this is probably like two years in, three years into the planting. Um, so the trees were planted on uh, double row, north and south oriented pine uh, plantation, basically plantation specs like eight by eight and eight by 10 foot. Um, basically, so eight feet between rows and then eight to 10 feet between trees within the row and then 50 feet of open pasture before the next double row. So, you know, two rows of trees, a large opening of an, of an alley, and then two rows of trees and just repeating that across the landscape. Um, and then just, <clears throat> just using pretty cheap single strand, um, you know, 14 gauge fence to just keep the livestock off of it. Um, while I'm grazing those alleys in between, the trees are, you know, being protected from the livestock. And then we have to um, bud cap the white pine to keep the deer from, from uh, browsing the, the terminal leader, uh, lead bud on those trees. So they keep getting taller every year. And um, it, the, the mixture here in the pasture is a, probably about a 10 way mix of grasses and forbs and, and legumes. Um, you can see on the right, we included chicory, which was fun to have for a few years. You know, a lot of the field would turn, you know, they get this, these bright purple flowers. And you know, so none of these are natives, um, but they, they, they're cool season plants, which um, work well with solo pasture. Um, you know, the cool seasons do better under partial shade than, than warm seasons. And generally we have more accessible access to affordable cool season uh, uh, plant seeds and things like that. So pretty, like I mentioned, we have to protect the terminal bud with a, a bud cap, which is just a quarter sheet of a, you know, eight and a half by 11 piece of paper cut, you know, just, just folded over and stapled uh, over the top of that, which keeps the deer from browsing that top bud. And then we've had some issues, particularly in the red pine with pocket gophers. So you got to kind of stay on top of that. But, you know, generally we're over planting the site from what we would, you know, need um, as far as having the ultimate tree canopy. So, uh, you know, way down the road, so we can lose some trees and it's fine, but when they start taking out a lot of trees in a row, you got to get on top of it. So just to be aware that there are things that can take out, um, some pretty good sized trees. Um, you know, we've lost some, even like still now we're losing like 10 to 12 foot red pine to pocket gophers every once in a while. Um, just a little bit later photos. I think these are two years old now, maybe three. So the trees are growing well. Um, we haven't really been doing, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of recommendations about herbicide and mowing and tree mats and all this stuff for controlling the herbaceous vegetation around the trees. But, um, I found that they, they've been doing quite well for the most part, growing two to three feet a year, um, you know, after that first year or so of getting established. Um, we planted really large stock, you know, the largest transplants that we could get from the state forest nursery. Um, and, and we planted in 2012, which is a pretty dry year, and we didn't provide any supplemental water, and they did just fine. Um, so planting really large trees is a good, the, the largest tree that you can afford and can reasonably plant in a, in a timely fashion um, is, is, worth, is worth doing. Um, just some more, looks kind of more of a photo tour here of our use. Again, we're grazing the air, the alleys in between the trees. You know, up there on the left is just cows grazing in the summer. Um, and in the, in the right there, uh, top center, I guess, is just, I'm using, you know, the trees have gotten large enough that I'm able to use them as a windbreak. So I've got, you know, little windbreaks scattered all across the field um, that allows me to outwinter my livestock in a comfortable environment where they're out of the wind and I can feed in the alleys. I can unroll hay bales in the alleys right next to those trees. 
um, and keep them nice and comfortable in, in a setting where if the trees weren't there, they would be, uh, you know, I'd have some livestock performance issues just from, you know, struggling with the cold. Um, on the upper right, I, I just to show that I've started to, you know, open up basically just a couple of the double rows to experiment with, you know, can I start running animals into these trees, you know, for a day and, you know, will they survive? Um, obviously the, the livestock love to rub on the trees. They, they do like to browse the, the buds, um, but these trees, this was actually two years ago now, or maybe going on three that I had these uh, just yearlings, yearling cattle grazing in there and um, the trees are fine. So they've continued to grow just fine. They've, they've been kind of browsed or rubbed, you know, kind of limbed up. Their bottom branches have been kind of broken off and whatnot, but the trees have, have been okay. They've survived that and keep growing well. Um, the bottom right there is the next year, I guess. You can see they're greened out and happy. Um, bottom left, there's just another photo, just kind of generally giving a bigger sense of the, you know, north, south rows of trees with 50 foot spacing in between and livestock grazing in, in, the, in the alleys um, until the trees get larger. Um, we've started grazing, yeah, we've started grazing sheep. Um, I guess I've got a photo at the end of this to show that, but we've started grazing lambs um, into the trees uh, pretty consistently in some of the red pine, especially. And this spring, I intend to put them in the white pine. So trees are big enough to handle the, the yearlings from what I can tell. So they're definitely able to handle the, 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 the lambs. Um, they can only reach so high and um, we, move, we move animals pretty frequently. So they don't get access to trees for very long. Um, they're never in an area for more than a day, day and a half before they move on and they don't come back for oftentimes 40 to 60 days between grazing events. Um, this last year, we had a volunteer event on the farm as part of one of our grants where we um, have been doing some oak savanna, um, civil pasture and oak savanna work. And we decided to plant um, white oak uh, burr and white oak into our pine silvo pastures as kind of a transitional crop. So, so the pine are, will serve as kind of an initial crop. And over the years after thinning and, and, and eventual harvest um, of those mature trees, um, instead of having, you know, nothing left behind tree wise, um, we'll have hopefully some 30, 40, 50, 60 year old white oak um, ready to take over the site and and be, be ready to, um, you know, continue that silvo pasture kind of in a new direction, you know, kind of allowing us an opportunity to maybe um, move the site towards an oak savanna restoration in these old fields um, with, with well-established trees. So the, yeah, so the other way that we've been working with silvo pasture, um, you know, when I, when I started farming, I would walk through our, our woods and it was honestly hard to kind of even get around in there. There was buckthorn coming in, um, a lot of a lot of native trees too that were coming in that um, were just really thick, and it was hard to get in and use the site. It was hard to even just walk around. Um, and I noticed that you know we have these very very large you know two hundred year old give or take uh, bur oaks that um, clearly were at one time growing in an open environment. Uh, full sun, no competition environment. They have very, they're very short trees, generally speaking, but they're very large, um, very large trunks with big branches that stretch out, you know, down towards the ground. And um, some of those lower branches have, have you know, since died um, with the shade that's been, you know, brought in over the last really probably 50, mostly 50 years or so. Um, most of the trees that are not the large oaks are around 50 years or younger there's occasionally a, you know a patch of some trees that are a little bit older but not much um, and there's basically zero oak regeneration in that in that site and I you know I looked around and I said okay well I've got I've got some some elm over here that you know are dying it's the last of the elms they're dying from Dutch elm and I've got a bunch of ash in here and I like ash trees but the emerald ash borer is coming and is nearby. So when that goes, I guess I'm left with black cherry, which doesn't actually seem to like it here that much. They don't get, they get to be tall and fairly mature, but then they, they die kind of young. They don't get really big. They, they seem to be sort of, um, sort of earlier, more of an early successional tree and they don't seem to have a long range component here and they don't, they don't produce much, you know, as far as a long range valuable crop. 
and and they like I said they tend to deal with a lot of disease issues. So then I'm left with um, aspen and ironwood and 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 coming in the in, the understory is a lot of buckthorn. Um, there's some um, box elder and things here and there, but you know I'm 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 looking at it and I'm saying okay if I don't get oaks regenerated here what what is this forest going to look like in 30 or 40 years or 50 years or whenever these oak trees die. Um, if there's no oak trees coming in, I think I'm going to be left with like buckthorn and maybe, maybe aspen and box elder if I'm, if I'm lucky, maybe some cherry here and there, but altogether a very, very different um, forest type. And I would say ecologically um, less valuable, substantially less valuable, maybe not, but I, I think that, yeah, it's a, it's a forest that I was much less interested in and I wanted to get oak regeneration. And I knew that, yeah, like the history, you know, of oak savanna would have involved bison and elk and fire and all these other things. And it just seemed like we needed to reintroduce some of that um, to the system. And, and um, so I started just slowly thinning in, in patches. I didn't do all at once. I just did kind of a little half acre here and there and then introduced, um, you know, our livestock and basically was grazing twice. I was moving twice a day. So they'd get an area for about 12 hours and then I'd move on and then they wouldn't come back for about a year. So I was very, very cautious when I first started doing this, knowing that livestock, you know, could be too heavy handed of a tool and their impacts could be deleterious pretty quickly. I'd seen obviously a lot of bad impacts, bad outcomes in my judgment um, from livestock in the woods over the years. Um, but so I, I started to introduce some of these management practices with livestock and, you know, starting to open up the canopy and learn how the, how, you know, different light coming in and livestock impact was inter was interacting and how that was impacting just from observation, you know, what that was doing to the soil, what that was doing to the plant community, how the livestock seemed, were they happy, were they comfortable, did they, were they, um, were they getting, you know, enough forage? Were they doing well? Were they gaining well? Was their body condition and coat, you know, telling me that they were healthy? Um, so just kind of slowly opening things up and experimenting just and, you know, just kind of farm scale experimenting and um, was really pleased with the results. Um, at first, I was just opening up really probably to about a 35% sunlight, which is, you know, we're, we're really targeting 50%. Um, for your cool season forages, if you want to do natives and a true, like more true warm season oak savanna habitat restoration, you're probably looking at 80, 75, 80, 85 percent sunlight is a target, you know, sort of a metric. And I just started opening up towards that 50 percent, um, but in kind of a two step. So I opened up partway just enough to get basically I found to be able to get forage established. And, and get a lot more light to the floor to grow a more herbaceous can, um, uh, understory and have something for the livestock to work with. Um, and then I've come back and thinned again towards that 50% level. Um, so here's just photos showing spring green up. Um, the leaves you can see on the trees are not fully leafed out. They're, they're really kind of halfway from bud break to, to full leaf. And we've got a lot of forage underneath. I don't have a good photo here showing Kind of the contrast for this site, but if if you go about 200 feet to the northwest of where this photo was taken, you can see where I haven't done any thinning and opening up, and it's there's basically nothing growing um, on the floor underneath there. It's so shaded by ironwood and and aspen and things that there's there's almost nothing growing in the spring. Um, and so this just shows you how lush you know this. I've really changed um, sort of the amount of light getting into the floor and, and really what kind of plants are, are establishing and maintaining themselves throughout the year. Um, it's really, you know, I've introduced orchard grass and, and red clover, um, again, non-natives, but um, I've found that they have played fairly well with, with the native plants that are in the system now. Um, orchard grass is a bunch grass, so it has less of a sort of tendency to sort of spread and, and form a dense sod that takes over and, and just sort of like a brome grass or a bluegrass or reeds canary grass, which can just kind of dominate a site. Um, and yeah, so it's really kind of a lot of grass, a little bit of brush, some, some saplings, some invade, you know, like we cut down the buckthorn and that's been re-sprouting, but the cattle have been kind of grazing it and keeping it down. It's not killing it, but it, they've been keeping it down a little bit. Um, so it's been, you know, fairly 
diverse understory here. You can see a lot of woodland ephemeral plants, um, you know, much more shade loving ephemeral spring plants, you know, that I'm, I'm maintaining in while having this, you know, flush of additional native plants that otherwise weren't really there before. And, and I've got this red clover and, and orchard grass coming in, mixing in with all this. And like you can see on the lower right here, the buckthorn is re-sprouted, but you know, this is probably four years after I started and um, I'm really 10 years in and I'm still seeing this in my understory. So even with the grazing that we've been doing, I've been able to maintain a pretty interesting plant community. The buckthorn has been kept down to where it's, um, so far I've only got a few plants that have gotten back to where they're starting to produce new flowers and new seeds. And so we're gonna start treating those areas, but otherwise it's just been adding to my forage base. Um, again, you can see on the left there, some, uh, it's Jack in the pulpit. Um, we've got a lot of these, yeah, very interesting spring plants. Um, ramps have been actually thriving in this system in this part of the woods. I didn't really see ramps here before. We've got other areas near the yard where we used to have, where we have a lot of ramps and we do some wild harvesting of ramps. And now I've got ramps spreading on their own, um, with the livestock introduction and the more light too, perhaps. I'm not really sure what ramps ideally like, but I'm seeing a lot more ramps um, in this part of the woods. Again, on the left there is an example of our forage. It's kind of more of a, you know, pasture dream forage base, really nice mix of, you know, legumes and grass um, mixed together there, um, kind of dense, you know, so that's, that's the kind of forage that makes cows and sheep really happy. They can get a nice big mouthful of grass and, and legumes that's high digestibility, good quality and fill themselves up quick and, and go lay down and um, just sort of relax and chew their cud. And that's, that's what leads to high animal performance. We want animals to quickly be able to fill their guts with high quality forage and then go lay down and relax. And that's good for them. They're happy. And that's, it's best for us too. It's best for our bottom line and our production metrics. Um, yeah, and since having done this, I mean, you know, it's the, again, the introduction of both livestock, you know, and a certain, maybe probably the certain type of grazing that we're doing, um, and, and the additional light that we brought in, but we're getting a lot of oak regen, um, especially after a big mask year. I mean, I've got thousands and thousands of, of, of oak seedlings, um, you know, like per, per square, I don't know, like per square yard or something like that. I mean, they just blanket the floor. Um, this is really just probably two years afterwards, just showing some of them. And, and they don't all make it, of course. There's a lot of um, voles and rabbits and deer and everything in the woods and things too. But we're getting the regen at least. And, and some of them are advancing. You know, some of them are, are surviving and, and making it, you know, for a few years. And, and I'm starting to protect some of them, as you can see here. Um, just showing what I'm doing with some fencing, just like my basic fencing stuff. I'm just putting single wires, strands of, of hot wire around uh, poly wire, which is usually not hot. But then when I'm around it with the livestock, I run my, my lead and back wires, you know, past these little plots where I'm protecting the trees. Um, so here, this is more of this spring sort of volunteer day on the right there using tree tubes and tree mats. And so we put those tubes over some, some small, probably one or two year old oak saplings or seedlings, or actually we planted there. We planted some of the leftovers that we had, but in other areas, I'm just protecting trees that have, you know, naturally, uh, established themselves and just trying to keep the deer and the livestock off of them. I don't find the cows do too much, but I think the deer and the rabbits and the voles are pretty hard on those. So just trying to give a little bit of a help hand um, for that future um, oak community. Um, and the quicker, I found that tree tubes are pretty good. I don't know if I have a photo here, probably not. Um, just another photo here of, of any, this is a site that's in, in process of moving more towards a, an oak savanna. We've seeded this with a pretty high diversity of native grasses and forbs uh, last spring. And um, so I'm, I'm, I've got to open this up more. There's not enough light, but I think there's enough light here to get it established. We got good take um, last summer, even with the drought. We got good establishment of the grasses and uh, I just need to get more light in here. So I keep working away at this, um, hoping to get towards an oak savanna there, just to kind of an experimental one and a half acre plot there within the woods. Um, there's just some photos here of the livestock um, kind of in action. You can see this sort of dappled shade. There are areas on the edges and different times of, of the day where it's full sun. 
you know, like not every plant is in like perfect 50% shade or something. It's kind of moving. It's a dappled shade. The shade conditions are moving throughout the day, but we produce quite a lot of forage um, in these sites, um, considering how much shade's being, you know, let down, but, um, and we let the plants get pretty tall. You know, I, I, I gen early boot, you know, our farm's name is, is an homage, I guess, to, to, to the boot stage of grass development. Um, and so it's just before the plant is really about to expose its seed head. It's, it's transitioning from vegetation to, uh, reproductive, you know, growth, and it's going to put its seed head out. And, and so we want to let that plant basically get as much, we want to maximize the vegetative growth and we want to maximize the roots that those plants are able to put down, the amount of energy that they're able to store under the ground, the depth they're able to reach, the carbon they're able to put there, the, the nutrients they're able to access. And, and so generally we're looking to graze pretty tall. And, and that, you know, is, is actually pretty good for cattle as far as the forage um, sort of quality and quantity. And it's, it's obviously all those metrics I just mentioned about the soil and water. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, it's also, you know, kind of a, a landscape that provides a lot more structure as far as like birds and mammals, you know, habitat wise, you know, and then we move on, you know, and then the landscape gets to rest and, and, you know, provide those services, uh, those ecological services when the livestock are gone. Um, just again here, just showing kind of some examples of before and after grazing here. Um, this is, these are actually some pretty like you can see the shrubs are pretty thick in this one area. This I've got one acre where the buckthorn's coming in kind of thick. And so we're going to use goats to hammer that this spring and maybe some, maybe some brush mowing. Um, but again, just showing the sort of like 12 hour before and after graze. And then, yeah, they don't come back. I've started grazing since I've opened it up more. We're back twice a year, oftentimes. Um, sometimes still it's once a year, just depending on um, conditions. I don't go in the woods when it's really wet. The soil is really high quality here and I'm, I'm, just overly cautious about compaction and things. So, you know, I adapt my management and I'm, I'm very, you know, we're, we're, we're shifting things all the time in, in, in how we're, when we're grazing, where we're grazing, which direction we're going, how long we're in there, um, just based on conditions and, and that sort of thing. Um, this is just showing the amount of forage that can be produced in these sites. I mean, this is pretty tall orchard grass in the upper left. You can see here on the right, this one orchard grass plant is, you know, the leaves are, if I pull them up straight or are reaching up to my pocket. Um, lower left there, you can just get a sense of the density. Um, you know, there's a lot of shade there in this photo, but I mean, there's a lot of density of, of grass. There's a lot of tonnage um, within these systems. And the lower right is just highlighting this buckthorn that is like, just after 10 years gotten to the point after cutting it that I have to go back and deal with it because it's about 10 feet tall again, maybe maybe eight, six, eight feet tall. Um, so we're gonna use goats. Like I said, we're gonna use goats and other tools to try and work that back. Um, here's just some kind of uh, comparative photos from this last summer's drought. Um, the upper left is our open field pastures. You know, we've got about 45 or 60 acres that are you know, open pasture, no trees. And they pretty much heat stressed and, and went, you know, dormant. Um, the seed heads came out in, I mean, it was early July, early June, maybe even late May. Some of those plants were already um, putting their seed heads out, out of heat stress. And you can see a lot of space between plants, bare soil, and um, yeah, the, just the amount of heat and sun that we had early in the year just basically shut these entire systems down. I Between April, first week of April and last week of July, we had um, about one and a half inches of rain and a lot of 90 degree days very early in the year. And I think we got about 10% of our normal uh, growth from these pastures over that time frame. On the right hand side there, upper right is the is just a photo of the sheep kind of grazing in some of our red pine silvo pasture in one spot. And just you can just see again the drought stress in those pastures. Um, and the trees here, you know, they're not really big enough to do enough with their shade to to really modify that microclimate much. The sheep can go in and find the shade and kind of lay down in it right there, which is good for them, but they're not, the trees aren't doing a whole lot for the forage base and the soil necessarily uh, at that point. But in the more established systems where we've been working with the wooded sites, you can see here in the lower left, these large open grown oak trees um, uh, and, and all the forage that was still produced here. 
Um, you know, so a little bit of shade went a long ways to modifying the microclimate for the soil and the forage there. And, and, and we were able to produce um, probably more like 60 to 70% of our total, you know, average normal forage production in these systems. Um, like I said, relative to what was probably about 10% or so in the open systems. So, so these, these established silvo pasture systems really, uh, really uh, like outperformed or relatively outperformed this last summer during a hot and dry period. And we were able to graze, you know, we were able to keep grazing with very, very little hay feeding um, out to about mid-August this year when most people were feeding in June. And that's because of our silvo pasture. It's because of some of our practice. It's, it's a lot of it's because of our regenerative grazing practices. We made a lot of good decisions about how we graze those open, that open ground so that it would still be ready when the rains returned. And thankfully the rains did return in August. Um, and we were able to grow a lot of forage in that open ground. And, and as a result, we were able to keep from really selling any cattle this last summer when a lot of operations, um, liquidated a lot of their herd or, or all of their herd um, due to the drought. So, uh, you know, it's, it was still a really hard year, um, but we were able to survive it. And um, I, I attribute that to silvopasture pasture and, and our grazing practices where we're, we're grazing tall and we're grazing with a lot of time in between grazing events. And um, yeah. So with this work, the last couple of years, I've had a number, we've produced a lot of different resources from both, you know, fact sheets and, and resource manuals and how to, you know, documents that you can look up, you know, PDFs here on our website. There's a lot of um, webinars, there's some podcasts, we've had a ton of field days and workshops. Um, more of those are coming this summer. Um, so if, if this is something you're interested in, you know, um, watch, you know, sign up, sign up uh, to be an SFA member and um, check out the uh, Civil Pasture Learning Network, sign up for that, and, and you'll get, you know, updates on when those field days and things are. And, and um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll mostly leave it there. I will say that I, I think that there's a lot of what it's, I, I know that, um, you know, obviously I'm aware of the negative impacts of livestock in forested systems uh, over the last number of decades. And um, there's a lot of sites that just don't, livestock don't belong in. Um, probably like maple basswood just shouldn't, I mean, I'm not saying it can't be done, but it's really challenging. And I'd say we should hold off until we're like masters at the rest of this. Um, but I think there's a lot of interest in this right now. And I think that, you know, we've got, according to one survey, over 600,000 acres of grazed woodlands in Minnesota alone right now. And you know, that's largely almost exclusively unmanaged grazing. So, you know, if, if, if the livestock are going to be in there, then let's manage them and let's try to, let's try to work with producers to, to improve the outcomes on those sites. Um, let's get creative and look at for the producers who really want to get, you know, uh, their management at a top level for habitat restoration. Let's work with people to do, you know, some oak savanna, oak woodland restoration on their sites. It's better than it turning into buckthorn. Let's work with the sites that are already in buckthorn and try to work with goats and, and find ways to, to improve the ecological outcomes there. And yeah, let's look towards plantations and, 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 and orchards and things, ways which can, you know, let's, let's get creative and find ways that we can get trees out into places where there aren't trees. And I think silvopasture pasture offers a really good um, option for that. It keeps it in production. And I think it's something that's attractive to a lot of landowners who aren't interested in maybe just planting it to trees, um, whether that's a plantation or just sort of a reforestation type approach. Um, I think silvopasture pasture is something that people are really interested in and a lot of landowners are across the state. So, you know, I think this is a good way to meet, meet people where they're at and get some really good outcomes for, for producers, but also for the land and water. And, and climate, especially where we're adding trees to, to pasture where there aren't any now. So I'll stop there.